Yeah. All right, we're recording. <laughs>
Alright, lots of stuff going on. Um, things to take note of that are happening over the course of the next few weeks. One is that next week is both Communion Sunday and Potluck Lunch, so stick around um, for Potluck Lunch after church. Um, the other thing is that our campaign to pay off medical debts in the local community is continuing. We're nearly at $4,000 raised, which means $400,000 of medical debt paid off. So we have until the end of September for this campaign, but like very anxious for us to hit that 10,000 mark and hopefully beyond. Please keep praying for this, um, contribute as you're able, but also be thinking about places um, and like organizations and coffee shops, what, whatever local thing you can think of that you can maybe bring a flyer to or just tell people about. like. As we spread the word, more people can give. So um, if you need a flyer, are they still? Yeah, there's some by the coffee. There's some by the coffee, and we also have these cute little business cards that have all the information that you need and like a fancy little QR code because we're fancy. Um, so keep on praying for that. The other things that are going on. This Wednesday, there is the dinner and discussion group about aging and elder care. Um, I'm going to pass the sign-up sheet along. I think pretty much everybody who's here has either signed up or is not going. But if for some reason I missed you, please do sign up. Thank you. It's just helpful to get a rough head count, especially because this one's going to be at Tanya's house. And if you don't know how to get to Tanya's house, Tanya would be the one to talk to you about that. But um, her house is not as large as this room is. So. <laughs> It's good for us to know how many people are coming to make sure we've got chairs for everyone, as an example. Um, very cool thing, cool thing, helpful thing, helpful thing. We'll go with helpful thing happening this Wednesday at the Elder Care Discussion Group, which is that we will be having a hospice nurse there to talk to us. Um, and she's going to be answering a lot of our questions, but also bringing tons of really helpful practical data with her. So if you're able to join, please do. Otherwise, I think we're going to try and record it for those who will be missing it. Other things that are going on. Um, on next Sunday, not only is it Communion Sunday, and also is it Potluck Sunday, but also, also, we're going to do a special collection, which I think this is like the first time we've ever done this since I have been at this church, um, to raise some money for Habitat for Humanity. Because they're building these four um, homes in the county, and there's a whole bunch of stuff that they're not fully funded on yet, and it's a lot more helpful for them to have the money to buy it through the avenues that they have than to try and like gather a toilet for them. So we're going to pass out for the first time ever the communion basket, I guess. And um, if you bring some cash or a check that's specifically written for Habitat for Humanity, whatever we gather, we will send over to them just next Sunday. And then another, another, another thing. On Saturday, July 8th, we're going to do a work day. We're still trying to figure out if we're at Oasis Market Garden with TJ, or if we're at Habitat for Humanity, or if we're at both. Um, Habitat's a little bit complicated on signing up for, but if you're able to know that like, you will be somewhere on that Saturday if you're interested, that would be really helpful for us to know that we've got some folks that are willing to get their hands dirty, literally. You got time to fly with big loads? In the morning, <laughs> so probably like 8.30, I would think. Um, yeah, but we will have hopefully more information about that mm -hmm. soon. If we're working with TJ especially, we want to be like out there first thing in the morning before the heat of the July summer hits. Um, and then, a reminder that July, we, or sorry, that in August, we will be taking a hiatus as a church congregation. So there won't be church services during the month of August, but of course, we encourage and welcome everyone to get together, to pray with each other, to have meals together, to do fun stuff, to do activities. Like, please don't hesitate to do that, but don't show up here on a Sunday morning because no one else will be here. I mean, you can, just no one else will be here. Um, those are all the announcements I have. Are, is there any other announcements that I missed, Tan Tanya? Um, I didn't see, and maybe I just missed it on the sign-up sheet, if anybody is willing to bring salad and dessert. Right, we don't have a formal method for that. So um, the formal method would be checking in with the folks that are signed up to organize that, but I'm happy to bring a thing, so talk to me about that later. Bertie, what kind of announcement do you have? I burnt my hand in the joke. Actually, that's a great 
great segue because we're moving over to the prayer time, and I would love to pray for you about that because that can't be very helpful. Thanks. So Bertie is um, recovering from a burnt hand, which is no fun. Just this morning. Oh, just this very morning. Okay. Well, we will be praying for you on that. Um, what else can we be praying for or celebrating with each other? Well, we're continuing to pray for Elizabeth, who is caring for her mom abroad. Yes, absolutely. And TJ holding the fort. And I have an update about Ashley, who um, Ashley and Mike and her family went to Ashley's grandmother's funeral, which went well, um, but they're now driving back from St. Louis, so please be praying for them on their travels back. Anything else? Diane and Raleigh are traveling. Yes, Diane and Raleigh are also traveling, so traveling in general, Smiths, Cooks. I, I have a prayer request for I, my mom. We don't have a ton of details yet. Um, she tends to get really frantic and kind of like information bomb us, but apparently she has a spot on her lung that is concerning and she needs to meet with the thoracic surgeon. So she's very troubled by this and very scared. Um, so if you can just be praying for her while she's like waiting to get all this lined up, that she would find some peace and calm in the midst of some pretty troubling news. Does anyone know how Jessie's recovery is going? Do you know how Jessie's doing? She is, uh, she's moving around. Okay. Um, and I, I think uh, getting back to normal life, but she's moving around very slowly, so. We can keep praying for that. Um, anything else? Let's go ahead and pray for each other. God, we thank you for a chance to gather together to connect with each other and to worship you as a group. We pray for those who aren't with us this Sunday, um, for Jessie as she is recovering from her procedure. We ask that you would continue to heal her and return energy and capacity to her and that she and Jay would be able to join us again soon. We pray for the Smiths and the Cooks who are traveling back here today, um, that you would protect them and bring them home safely. We pray too for Elizabeth who is in Switzerland caring for her mom, that you would be with her and her mom, that you would give Elizabeth um, strength and patience capacity to, to to meet her mom where she's at, and that you would continue to um, give TJ everything that he needs to, to care for the two boys together on his own. Um, we pray to you for Bertie and for his burnt hand that is never comfortable. God, we ask that you would heal that and that he would find relief soon. And we thank you that, um, that you have created us with bodies that are able to heal from these things. We pray for Karen, for my mom, that you would be with her in her processing of this news, that you would guide her to swift answers, that she would, uh, she would find the right medical care, but that she would also be able to know that she is safe with you and that you are with her even now. God, as we enter this time of worship and as we listen to the story of the unfolding of Jesus' life and death through the Gospel of Mark, meet us in this too and help us to know you better and to love you better and to know that how much we are loved by you. Amen. I have the kiddos today, so if they wish to follow me, they may.
So uh, if you get a chance, and it's, it's floating around out there and on the envelope, it just says the Baileys. So uh, sign that if you have a chance, and we're going to mail it to them this week. So um, please turn either in your handouts or in your Bibles to Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through 41. And we all learned important lessons even before the sermon starts, which is that if you copy uh, a text of scripture from BibleGateway.com and you paste it into a Google document and you don't hit uh, change formatting, it pastes at a very small font size, even if you told it to be a large font size. But somehow the verse numbers were huge. So you'll be able to read the verse numbers if nothing else. But I'm going to read it aloud to you so you'll be able to follow along. Uh, so as Mel said, we've been uh, following this series through the Gospel of Mark. And the past couple of weeks, we've talked about this teaching uh, that Jesus had been doing with uh, parables and, and stories about the kingdom. And you remember last time, uh, there was such a crowd on the beach that he had his disciples um, let him sit in a boat so he could sort of sit in the cove on the Sea of Galilee and, and talk to the whole uh, uh, cove full of people as, a, as an amphitheater. Um, and then we continue from there. So, that day, when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified, and they asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. I learn a lot of science facts from uh, Matt, who paid a lot more attention in his science classes than I did in school, and continues to read about and learn about science. And uh, so I always ask him if I have science questions. And I learned a new word from Matt a couple of years ago, which is thalassophobia. All right, so say that, thalassophobia. Thalassophobia. Thalassophobia, that's very good. So um, that comes from two Greek words, thalassa, which means sea, like S-E-A, the sea, and phobia, which means fear. And uh, thalassophobia is fear of the sea, but it's not just like, oh, I'm looking at the ocean and I'm scared I want to run. It's very specifically fear of all the things that might be under the water but you don't know what they are because the ocean is really, really big and really deep. It's like maybe you wade out into the water and it's fine, but then when you get out where your feet can't touch the bottom anymore, suddenly you start thinking about all the many miles of space that are below you and how it gets really dark really quick and how in some ways we know a lot more about the far reaches of outer space than we do about what's down there. And then you think about how every so often there's like creatures that wash up on the beach and scientists go, huh, we had no idea that horrible looking monster was lurking down there with like claws for eyes and feet for teeth. And um, then you think, well, you know, people get lost at sea all the time. And then you think there could be like rusty old wrecks down there and it could cut my foot. I wouldn't even know what was going on. And then you decide you're going to go back on the beach and just sit under an umbrella, on a towel, and not go way out in the water. You're just going to look at it, because it's pretty. It's pretty to look at. Um, and, of course, on a more serious note, we were all reminded in the news this past week of how very dangerous the sea can be. Uh, when five people lost their lives um, going on this, uh, this tourism expedition to visit the wreck of the Titanic, a boat which had been swamped by the sea. And uh, they went down and were never, they never came up again because it's incredibly dangerous down there because of all the currents and the pressure and all the things that can go wrong. Actually, both of those words, the lassa and phobia, appear in this passage. Um, 
there is a lot about the sea in this, and there's a lot about fear in this story. But the story's not mainly about the sea, and it's not mainly about fear, although we'll talk about both those things. It's mainly about the question that happens at the very end. In verse 41, the whole ending of the story that it leaves you with before it moves on to the next thing is, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. As we've gone throughout Mark, all these people are saying, who is this about Jesus? And he's revealing more and more about who he is and what he's like and what he can do. And it's like this mystery is slowly becoming clear. And people are saying, who is this? Who is Jesus? That's the question the disciples are left with. And they realize that this guy they thought they knew has whole other dimensions to him that they were not aware of. And they're more scared of that in some ways than they were of the sea. And that question, who is Jesus for us today, still echoes for us today. This is a story about something that happened to real guys on a real lake, the Sea of Galilee, that you can still go to, um, in a real boat, at a real time. But it was also intentionally put into Scripture by the Holy Spirit and the first followers of Jesus who wrote down these stories. Because it's not just about something that happened one time to some guys in a boat on a lake. It's also about who is Jesus for us when we are facing storms and the sea. So, first, Jesus is with us even when we feel abandoned. So the disciples get scared about this violent squall, this violent storm. Um, and remember, some of them were professional fishermen on this lake. They were used to being out. So if this storm is scaring them, this is an impressively awful storm. This is something where even the pros are saying, hey, you got to respect the sea. I am scared of this. There were, uh, and still are, uh, a weird formation of mountains around this sea, and it's kind of low-lying, and so the winds come in, and they all get funneled down these canyons and valleys, and so they slam into the sea at high speed, being funneled through these narrow gaps, and so it, it can go, especially in the evening time, from flat calm to harsh storm that lasts all night. They're scared, and it says uh, in verse 37, the waves were breaking over the boat, not an expert sailor, but I've been out on a couple of boats. And I generally know that you want the water to stay under the boat. Or maybe in front of, maybe behind, but generally mostly under the boat. If the water's coming over the boat, that's getting big. The waves are breaking over the boat, and then it says the boat was nearly swamped. So it started to fill up. Things were bad. And then they turn around. They're all, you know, doing all their stuff, and pulling on the rope that I don't know the name of, and pulling on the other thing that I don't know the name of. And then they look back. Jesus is asleep in the stern, in the back of the boat, on a cushion. He's just tired. He's been teaching and healing all day for days. And he's asleep. And they wake him up. And they say, teacher, aren't you concerned? Or don't you care that we're drowning? Uh, the NIV that I pasted here says, um, don't you care if we drown? What it, what it just bluntly says is like, aren't you care... Don't you care that we are dying? Don't you care what's happening to us? We all go through situations where what's bad about it is not just the things that are happening to us, not just the awful thing, the wave that looks like it's going to crash over the boat. That's bad enough. But then sometimes when we turn to God for help or we look around for what we think would be evidence of God's presence, it seems like he's asleep, or he doesn't care. And that makes it so much worse. Because it's not just that we're going to have something bad happen to us. It's that we're going to go through it alone. And the one who we, we think we've been doing good stuff for and following, and, that, and that's, you know, that's part of the deal, that he's going to be with us. He doesn't care, or he's asleep. And that can make it feel so abandoned that um, you are not just going through something bad, but that you're going to have to go through it bad, and God is indifferent to it. One of the things that the story is saying is that our perceptions aren't always accurate. They thought that Christ didn't care, but he did. He was in the boat, he was sleeping, he knew that things were going to be fine, 
and he gets up and he has the power to instantly fix it. I don't know why he didn't fix it before. I don't know why he let them go through the storm. It was actually his idea to get in the boat and go across. So he, I mean, maybe he even knew the storm was going to happen. And I don't even know what's up with that. But Christ was with them even when they thought that he didn't care. What if in situations where we feel like he's asleep or he doesn't care, he is, and he's going through the storm with us, and he's fully committed to seeing our boat arrive safely at its destination? Faith, and I think the hard part about faith, it's it's not um, believing that everything's going to turn out okay. That's that's not what faith is, because as some of you know much better than me, much better than I, much better than I, <laughs> faith can say, oh, everything's going to turn out okay, but everything doesn't always turn out okay. Sometimes everything turns out quite badly, and the boat is getting swamped or even sinks. Faith is a matter of believing. That Jesus cares, cares what happens to us, and is with us, and is committed to our, our good. So, so far, that's not super comforting. Like, he's there, you don't know he's there, he cares, but what's he going to do about it? So, second part. Who is Jesus? Who is this? Jesus is stronger than the forces of chaos in our lives. So, Jesus gets up, he wakes up, and it says, he rebukes the wind, and he says to the waves, quiet, be still. I was looking at the, the language and different ways to translate that. What he actually says is, silence, be muzzled. Like a muzzle, you would prone a dog. Can you imagine saying that to a storm? I mean, think about, it's easy to sort of imagine that when we're inside a nice room on a nice sunny day. But like, think about being on a lake that's big enough that you can't see the shore. And you're in a storm at night that's so powerful, you think you're going to die. And he stands up and says, can it? He says, put a lid on it. And it's immediately calm. It doesn't say, and gradually over the course of several hours, things got slightly better. No. Everything goes to a, a terrific call, a great call. The disciples are filled with awe and fear because they see even the wind and the waves obey him. So they had seen him do little things. You know, he had taught some interesting stories. He healed some small things. Individual people here and there from sicknesses. He turned some water into wine. Good to have at parties. But now he's controlling the wind and the sea. This is a million times bigger than anything they've seen him do before. And maybe, it doesn't say this in the text, but maybe some of them remember, because remember, these are all devout Jewish men. They have been raised from birth with these psalms and these songs about all the things that God did. God did what at the Exodus? calmed uh, the sea when it needed to be calmed, and then he parted it, and then he brought it back together. And uh, the Psalms were full of talking about how God has control over the wind and the wind. Psalm 65, 7, he quiets the roaring of the seas and stills the roaring of their waves. We're talking about God, not just some prophet, but God. Psalm 107, 23 through 30, you should read it sometime. It gives this amazing account of what it's like to be in a storm at sea. It says some people, they go down to the sea in ships and they go out on great waters and the wind and the waves come up and they feel like they're going up a mountain and then going down another mountain and they reel like they're drunk because they can't stand up because it's so, and they're terrified and they cry to the Lord in their distress and he miraculously stills the storm. Jesus is doing something in this verse that so far in the Bible we've only seen God do, the one God do. The storm is a real storm, and he really quiets it. It's not just a symbol. But it's more than just a wind effect of some canyons off the coast of the Sea of Galilee. Remember that throughout Scripture and around the ancient world and all the culture, the air that these guys breathed, the sea, even a large, large lake like the Sea of Galilee, was also um, the place where bad, chaotic things were. Because they knew, just as we knew, that a lot of people go out to sea and don't come back. And sometimes the sea is supposed to stay over here, but it decides it's going to come all the way over here and wipe out your whole village. The sea is not controllable. The sea is this place of chaos and weird stuff happens at sea. And they thought of it as a place that is filled with chaotic forces. And the stories they told were about uh, the sea being the place where destruction lives. And even evil spirit, they even personified it sometimes. It was 
a symbol of all of the awful, chaotic, destructive forces that can just pop up and smash your life. When your life is going fine, and then you get that phone call. When your life is going okay, and then that person says we need to talk. When your life is going fine, and then a war breaks out and just rolls over your village. These forces of chaos and destruction that seem so much bigger, they are so much bigger than any one person. And Jesus doesn't just calm down some wind and make some waves go from 10 feet to one foot. He shows that he has control over these forces of chaos, that he's bigger than that. Um, and then uh, as you go on, you, you learn that as soon as he gets to the other side of the sea, he's going to be met by this guy who's so possessed by evil spirits, a legion of evil spirits, that no one can help him or control him. He's out of control. And Jesus is more powerful than that as well. We live in fear of so many things. Things we know about, things we don't know about, things we can't control, things we can't control. Mm -hmm. uh, lack of money, loneliness, um, death, disease, mass shooters, um, unemployment, people not thinking well of us, all kinds of things that we live in fear of. And it's not wrong to see dangers around us or to be careful about things. Many of them are real, real threats, but when we forget that the one who's with us is stronger than those things, we panic. I actually don't think it was wrong for the disciples to be worried about a storm. God never tells people to be these sort of like Zen detached folks that are like, yes, a storm is hitting me. How interesting. Let me observe the phenomenon. There's a giant squid right there. Neat. No, um, he doesn't say, and he doesn't say like that there aren't things to be afraid of. I think where they where they went over the line was that they were panicking, thinking he didn't care, and thinking that there was nothing that could be done about it. God, specifically in the person of Christ, is stronger than these forces that we fear that attack our lives. He is, they did the worst that they could do to him. They killed him. Even death. The big one. They killed him. They spent all their ammunition on him, and he got back up. And now he's in the process of of subduing and defeating these things. And I admit, it is sometimes very hard to see that because there is evil and chaos and unbreakability in the world. But the one who is with us is more powerful than those. So finally, Jesus is the one who wants us to have more faith, but still saves us even when our faith is small. Um, Jesus gives the disciples a verbal smack here. Uh, if you look at verse 40, he says to his disciples, after he calms the sea, after he calms the sea, and everything's fine. He, so he's not one of those people that in the middle of an emergency situation, while you're like running around trying to you know bandage the wounded, is like, ugh, how did you why did you do it that way? Why did you, ah, come on? No, he waits till everything's fixed. And then he says, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? I mean, you guys have been with me for months and months now. You've seen all these things that I've done. Do you still have no faith? In other words, why do you fall into despair? Don't you think I'm going to be with you and take care of you and that I'm powerful enough to handle this? I notice that he doesn't say, hey, it's fine. Like, it's fine. I'm still going to fix everything. It doesn't really matter if you trust me or not. Like, that's cool. I get it. Life is hard. You don't have to have faith. I'll, be, I'll take care of it. He wants the disciples to grow in their faith. He wants that for them, not just because he's God and he deserves to be worshipped, but he wants them to be able to handle all the challenges that are going to be coming their way. They're going to have demonic opposition. They're going to have the crowds abandoning him when he starts to teach things they don't like. They're going to have the hatred of their own religious leaders from their own community. Their leader is going to be arrested and tortured, taken away, and killed. And then, not long after, he's going to give them this worldwide mission and be like, all right, You've had your apprenticeship. Now go tell the world about me, and they're going to hate it. And he's going to need them to have faith. He wants them to grow. It's good for them to have more trust in him. And he wants us to grow in our faith, too. He sometimes, I think, says to us, why are you still so panicky? Like, don't we have a track record together over the course of your life? Haven't you seen that I've been with you before? I've gotten you through those things you were so scared of. 
I want you to grow in your faith because it's good for you. But, despite the fact that he's, I think, disappointed, he still helps them. In fact, he, like I said, he helps them before he smacks them. As one commentator says, I, I love this, he says, Jesus doesn't say, as he might have, come back later when your faith is stronger, and then I will help you with this storm. He helps us however we come to him. In, a, in another um, gospel, another version of the story, he, he says, oh, here in the old translation, he says, oh, ye of little faith. And there's a song we're going to hear later that says, oh, me of little faith. Sometimes we only have a little bit of faith. But Jesus responds to anyone who comes to him. You don't have to have this robust, bulletproof faith. He will still help you. Yes, he wants you to grow, but he is still a compassionate Savior. There are storms in your life that are bigger than your faith. There are things that happen to us all. There are things that are currently happening to some of you that are bigger than your faith. What I don't want you to do is to make this a story about you and how you have to have like a certain amount of faith to get through the storm and to go home and beat yourself up and be like, I need to have 20% more faith this week. That's not what this story is about. The story is about who is this Jesus? And the answers turn out to be good. They're scary. Notice they were actually more scared after the storm got called. called. Um, they were afraid, but then in verse 41, they were terrified because they looked at him and they realized this is not somebody we can control. This is not somebody we completely understand. But he's good. You can turn to him for help with confidence that he really does care about the trouble you're going through, even when you can't always see him in it. And he will get you through it. This week, I encourage you to look for Jesus' presence in the hard things you're going through. And to remember, as the disciples forgot, the track record that he has with you, that he's gotten you through things, that he's brought good things, even though there were bad things in your life. And let that encourage your faith in him. Let's pray. Christ, we thank you for this story. Thank you for the details in it that tell us that these men never forgot what happened on this evening. Thank you for the fact that you are there. You are stronger than the forces of chaos that we're so afraid of. You're stronger than death, stronger than nature, because it all belongs to you. And you are bringing it under your control. As we wait for that day when there will be no more chaos, no more evil, no more death, pain or death. We ask that you will give us patience and faith, not to be uh, so serene that nothing ever is scary, but so that we turn to you quickly and naturally when storms do come. Amen. I forgot to say, but this is really cool. I don't want to not include it. Say At the end of the book of Revelation, when God makes the world new, it says there's no longer any sea. It doesn't mean that God hates water. God loves water. God invented water. Um, it doesn't mean that there's no longer any beautiful lakes and streams and rivers and things like that. It means, as I said, that those forces of chaos and evil and death that the sea always symbolized for the people of that time are going to be wiped out are going to be brought back into the control that they always should have been under. And I find that a beautiful promise. And I hope that you do. Not really.
Think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wired by the human standard. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God. That is, our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. For the Lord said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I called you from the farthest corners of the earth. I said, you are my servant. I have chosen you, and I have not rejected you. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Christ is not weak in dealing with you, but is powerful among you. For to be sure, he was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by God's power. Likewise, we are weak in him, yet by God's power we will live with him to serve you. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. When we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? And so we rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Please stand and sing these songs with us.
We beg you, O Lord our God, be patient with us sinners. You who know our weaknesses, protect the work of your hands now and in times to come. Deliver us from all temptation and all danger and from the powers of darkness of this world. And bring us into the kingdom of your, holy, of your only Son and our God. For to your most holy name be the glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever, to the ages of ages. Amen. Amen. May the cross of the Son of God, which is mightier than all the hosts of Satan, and more glorious than all the hosts of heaven, abide with you in your going out and your coming in, by day and night, at morning and at evening, at all times and in all places. May it protect you and defend you from the wrath of evildoers, from the assaults of the evil spirits, from foes visible and invisible, from the snares of the devil, from all passions that beguile the soul and the body. May it guard, protect, and deliver you. Amen. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely, goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Same as last time we Thank you.
bring us safely to shore, and that we would know that you're doing it, and that we would be able to trust in you in the process. We ask you that you would increase our faith so that we can give courage and strength and encouragement to others who need it when they are going through rough seas. Now as we go throughout this week, we ask that we will know that you are with us. Amen. So we have two birthdays, but neither one of them here, so we're going to catch you both next time. Uh, Megan and Emily, and they're both out of town. So, well, Emily's recovering from having a baby, Megan's out of town. We'll get the next one.